Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's give it a couple minutes as I see people are coming in. Okay, I see with our, uh, by our clock that uh, we probably need to go ahead and get started as people are, are coming in. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Kim Day, and I serve on the board of directors at IDA uh, Georgia. I'm pleased you've joined us this evening uh, for the second webinar in our Spotlight on Structured Literacy series. This series was jointly planned and hosted by IDA Georgia and the Reading League of Georgia. We're very excited about this partnership and we look forward to continuing to collaborate in the future. Before we get started, I uh, wanna extend a special thank you to those who've helped plan this series. Uh, Lisa, Mur Lisa Murray, uh, who co-chaired the webinar committee, Jennifer Lindstrom and uh, Nicole Vela, uh, who helped decide on topics and to uh, and select speakers. Also, um, Jen Birch and Norris Lessinger, who worked on uh, getting uh, all of our sponsors, Rachel Pierce and Delilah Landrum for their work in marketing, Anne-Marie Lewis for um, all the work she's done with registration, and she will be the person that sends out the certificates of attendance. Um, and for those behind the scenes, uh, Mary McPherson, who is providing us uh, with behind the scenes Zoom support this evening, along with Ashley Edwards and Elizabeth Hogan uh, from the Reading League, who also provided behind the scenes support. Uh, for one of our webinars. So on behalf of the board of directors and members of both IDA Georgia and the Reading League, I'd like to welcome all of you. I know many of you are joining us uh, from across the state of Georgia, but also from across the country and in places around the world. So thank you for joining us this evening uh, for the second webinar in our um, series on the uh, uh, spotlighting uh, structured literacy. Uh, our uh, webinar tonight is the syntax attuned educator supporting students ability to comprehend sentences and uh, we think you're going to learn a lot from our speaker this evening Dr. Margie Gillis. Uh, in case you weren't able to join us in January for the first webinar in the series reading fluency essential for reading comprehension with Dr. Gillis. The recording of that session is now on the IDA Georgia website uh, for you to see. In tonight's webinar uh, Dr. Gillis will share research on the role of um, that syntactic knowledge plays in reading comprehension. She'll explain why teachers need to build their own syntactic knowledge and will provide information on instructional activities to support students ability to comprehend a variety of sentences. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker, let me remind you that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation this evening. If you have any questions for Dr. Gillis, please submit them at any time through the chat at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring your questions to pass along to uh, Dr. Gillis. Again, please submit questions uh, through the chat located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and thank you to those who submitted questions uh, when you registered. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, for this evening, Dr. Margie Gillis. Dr. Gillis is a certified academic language therapist a research affiliate at Haskins Laboratories, and the founder and president of Literacy How, a nonprofit organization that provides professional development for teachers on how to apply the science of reading. Margie is also the president of the Ann Fowler Foundation, providing scholarships for educators. She is the co-founder of Smart Kids with LD, the former president of the Connecticut branch of IDA, and a board member of the Academic Language Therapy Association and the Reading League of Connecticut. She is uh, an editor of IDA Perspectives Journal and the Reading League Journal and a professional advisor for Understood, ReadWorks, and the International Foundation for Effective Reading Instruction. Margie believes that learning to read is a civil right and that all children benefit from research and evidence-based instruction. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Margie Gillis. Thank you very much, Kim. And um, thank you again for inviting me to, to do this talk tonight. Can you all hear me okay? 
Thumbs up. Uh, I can see Jen. Great. I'm assuming that if you all can hear me, that our uh, participants can hear as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and launch into my PowerPoint here. And I will have slides. These slides will be available to you um, so that you can um, you know, just sit back and listen, take notes if you want, but you will get copies of these slides. So as Kim said, um, I am a certified academic language therapist, which is kind of like an Orton Gillingham um, associate. Uh, in terms of learning about the structure of language. I did that certification many years ago, and I worked with students with various reading difficulties for about 15 years. And then I decided to turn my attention to uh, professional development for teachers. And I was a special educator for the first 20 years of my career. Um, when I took on the role as a professional development provider, I guess, for lack of a better word, I um, shifted from special education to general education. And that was because the grant that um, Haskins Labs received, this was in 2000, really was focusing on general education, what could teachers do in their classrooms to bring the science of reading uh, to students. And this was 2000, so the science of reading was not the term that we used. Um, that's the term that I think is most commonly used today. Then we called it scientifically based reading instruction. It's a mouthful. Um, so really our charge starting in 2000 post national reading panel was to translate the research for teachers. Uh, again, primarily gen ed teachers, primarily kindergarten through third, fourth, fifth grade, and really help teachers understand that there's a lot of research that wasn't getting translated for them in their teacher prep programs. And they really, we knew, we all believed that if they knew that science and if they had opportunities to apply and be coached through how to use that science or apply that science in their classrooms, there would be a, a greater um, benefit for students and we would see outcomes for students. We did get a great grant um, four years later from the Institute of Education Sciences. We studied first grade reading in 120 first grade classrooms in Connecticut. And we learned a whole lot about providing uh, professional development, coaching support, so forth and so on. Um, it was a great learning experience. In 2009, the grants started to dry up and I could not bear the thought of stopping this work that I had, I was just so immersed in and loving every minute of. So I took a leap of faith and started Literacy How um, so that I could keep the work going. I have a team of 10 wonderful mentors who, help me by going into schools every day and translating the research in for teachers. We are working pre-K all the way up through high school now. And we have a real range of uh, contracts. We're now working in gen ed, special ed, reading interventionists. Um, so it's, it's wonderful work. And anybody who wants to talk about professional development and get, um, get some tips. Um, I have my email at the end of the presentation. I'm always happy to share what we've learned. Um, so again, Literacy How, it's a nonprofit organization. We empower teachers with knowledge because we believe that the key variable in the classroom is the teacher who has a wealth of knowledge that they can bring to their teaching, you know, to their experience and, and their day-to-day -day, um, instruction. Reading programs can be great, they could be mediocre or they could be lousy, to be honest, right? And I'm sure if you've been teaching a long time, you've been encounter you've encountered some of each. So we believe if you have a mediocre program, if you know a lot, you can actually make it that much better and that much more effective. Um, because Kim was great at scoping out our objectives for today. I won't read these to you, um, but we're gonna tackle each of these three objectives. And I would just like to, to read the quote at the bottom. 
um, my colleague Nancy Hennessy, who's done phenomenal work on syntax and comprehension and, and all sorts of uh, reading related topics, says that at the sentence level, the comprehender needs to work out the syntactic structure and sense of each sentence. Simply deriving the meanings of those individual words and sentences is insufficient. So that kind of kicks us off in terms of what you know, why is syntax important? I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Jan Hasbrook, who I think is phenomenal, does great work, and I know presented um, to the first in the first uh, webinar in January. I watched her webinar. I thought it was excellent. I, and I asked her if I could use some of her slides because there is a lot of... Um, correlation uh, isn't probably the right word, but certainly connection between reading fluency, um, syntax, and comprehension. And I love this quote defining what reading fluency is as a highly complex task that involves interconnected and codependent linguistic processes that draw upon a variety of separate skills. So I couldn't define it any better, so I went right to the master. And Jan expanded on that to say that those skills are really depicted in Hollis Scarborough's rope, which many of you have seen, but if you're new to the rope, um, I'm happy to introduce it to you. Uh, those of us who use it in our presentations value um, just what a great pictorial representation it is of the complexity of reading. And so if you know the simple view of reading, the simple view of reading says that reading comprehension is the product of two very different components. One is language comprehension and the other is word recognition. In the formula, it actually says LC times D equals RC, right? So LC is up here and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. D stands for decoding, otherwise known as word recognition. And this rope shows the, the automaticity that must be um, in place in order to be able to lift words off the page automatically, to be able to look at every word and see it by sight and know what it means, what it looks like, what it sounds like. That's what decoding is all about. The flip side of that and the other side of the equation is language comprehension, how well we can understand the, the, the language that we hear, not the language that we're reading, but the language that we're hearing. And there are these five strands that you see here that relate to being what I like to call metacognitive. Uh, Hollis used the word strategic here, but basically thinking about what we're listening to in this case, or if we're talking about reading comprehension, what we're reading. This is much more complicated, higher order uh, than word recognition that really is more about learning how the alphabet works and mastering those, those um, sound symbol correspondences and those um, patterns, those spelling patterns so that we can eventually orthographically map to build our sight word vocabulary. But tonight we're gonna to talk about um, the top of the rope, um, the language comprehension side of the equation. And we're gonna to specifically tonight focus on the language structures. And you see syntax and semantics are put here in parentheses. Tonight, I'm really gonna speak specifically about syntax. But over here, um, Jan also pointed out, if you can see my cursor here, um, if you think about fluency, Jan said, well, fluency is really, if you're reading fluently, you're putting everything together. You're, you're decoding words automatically while comprehending what you're reading. And that's the mark of a skilled reader. Uh, since this is an IDA talk co-sponsored by IDA Georgia, um, I wanted to just uh, you know, call attention to the IDA brief here. Um, I don't even think you have to be a member of IDA, although I encourage you all to join both the IDA and the Reading League because they're just a wealth of information from both organizations. But um, 
I don't, I think there's a lot of information from both organizations that's in the public domain. And I particularly liked this, um, this description of structured literacy that is in the IDA brief that you can download. It's, um, it's a great, I think it's like a five page description. So it goes into great detail, but I like this um, particular definition as structured literacy as an approach to reading instruction where teachers carefully structure concept skills, sequence of instruction, et cetera, and that this approach can be beneficial not only for students with reading disabilities, but also for other at-risk students, including English learners and structure, uh, struggling adolescents. So tonight, I'm not gonna go into structured literacy in detail, but certainly syntax is one very important element that we are going to want teachers to understand to become syntax attuned in order to support their students' understanding of grammar and syntax. And some of you may have seen uh, Nancy Young's reading ladder. Not too long ago, she revised it. So you might not have seen um, the more recent version of that. Um, I'm moving something, hold on one second. This is in my way and I can't see. Uh, blocking me. Let's see if I can get it out of the way. There we go. Um, so she added uh, and writing to this uh, ladder not too long ago. So the ladder of reading and writing. And what I want, uh, if you haven't seen it, it really sort of classifies students into four different groups. Uh, we have students who learn to read relatively effortlessly or seemingly effortlessly, estimated to be five to 10% of the population. So not very many students basically don't need any instruction at all. It's almost like they come into the world and they could pick up a book and start reading it. Um, the next category, 35% roughly, and this is based on her research, um, read relatively easily with broad instruction. And yet explicit instruction for spelling and writing are most likely needed, even though they might learn how to decode, they might learn how to read relatively easily, as it says here. The next category down is the, is the majority of students, 40 to 45%, who have difficulty learning to read, spell, and write, and require a code-based systematic and explicit approach, aka structured literacy approach. And then we have 10 to 15% of the population, this group at the bottom, that um, require it because of most likely um, identification of dyslexia and or you know, another reading difficulty that or disability that requires very intensive, um, very explicit, um, and in some cases, individualized instruction. What I want you to just notice over here is that a structured literacy approach is likely essential for these bottom two groups. And I shouldn't say bottom, I don't mean bottom in, as in bad, um, but the ones at the bottom of this graph um, or this picture. Um, the top, top, this third category, um, actually structured literacy is likely very valuable to them as well. And here we're talking about extension. Will the students in this top group benefit from learning some of this, this work and uh, not work, but some of this information? You bet they will, but they don't require it the way many other students do. So if you take a look at Nancy Young's website, she has lots of other great information there too that I think you'll find um, informative. So as I mentioned, there are, there are elements of structured literacy. You can see them here in this little infographic. And, and this approach to teaching reading, and it is an approach, is characterized by the provision of systematic explicit instruction that integrates listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And most importantly, it emphasizes the structure of language across the different structures that linguists and SLPs learn all about, and that is the speech sound system, phonology, the writing system, orthography, the sentence structure system, syntax, the meaningful parts of words, morphology, the relationships, 
between and among words, in phrases, in sentences, semantics, and then how is language organized? Um, and here it's talking about the organization of spoken and written discourse. So I'm gonna take a moment, just one moment to talk about the difference between spoken and written discourse uh, because one of your questions, and by the way, thank you for your questions, which we very carefully read and talked about and tried to think about how we might incorporate some of those um, as I go along. One uh, person asked about oral versus written syntax. And so I'm not positive I know what your question um, is specifically about, but here's what I think is probably good information for everybody to be thinking about. Oral language, when we're talking to our peers or talking to whoever, we're not speaking in complete sentences all the time. In fact, young people are not, right? They're using colloquial expressions. They say like, um, they stop and pause because they're looking at the person they're talking to, hopefully, and they're interacting with them. So our oral language is very, very different than our written language. And so we have to, even though oral language comes to us for free because we're biologically wired to learn to speak, right? And listen, written language doesn't work that way. We actually have to explicitly be explicitly taught about these structures that are listed here, including how syntax works. So that's the topic of today's conversation. Now I'm uh, showing this table because I think it also does a nice job of laying out the, the components of oral language comprehension. Uh, some of those I've talked about already, and I'm not gonna go into detail about this. You will get this slide. If you also can Google um, perspectives, um, language comprehension issue. And I, and I might, if, if somebody knows what it is or can put that in um, the chat or I can send it to you with my slides at some point. It's a great article. Um, the article in itself is actually very good about language um, listening and listening comprehension. But I like the descriptions here. I like the sample assessment tasks that are listed here. And what I really like about this um, table is it shows the relationship between language and literacy. And that's something that I'm very sensitive to making sure teachers understand. Language and literacy are not separate, right? They're inextricably linked. And here is our syntax component, the aspect of language involving grammar and word order at the sentence level. What might you do as a, as a, as a teacher to determine your student's syntax? And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but teacher might ask students who have listened to a grammatically complex sense, sentence to explain who or what is doing the action in the sentence to see if after listening to a long sentence and a sentence that might have um, elaborated noun phrases and relative clauses that could be hard to follow, if they can tell you the, the noun and the, and the um, verb or the subject and the predicate, then you have a pretty good idea that they've understood that sentence and they have good syntactic awareness. Why is that important? Um, it's important not only for comprehension of sentences, in reading, it's also extremely important for writing. And unfortunately, because I am really, I've got an hour to cover a whole lot of information tonight, I will not be talking about writing too much, but you, you're, in, you're in luck because um, there is going to be a writing webinar on April 27th. And uh, Laura Dreyer will be doing that and talking about writing extensively. And I'm sure she'll reinforce some of the things that, that I cover today. Um, the Literacy How Reading Wheel is something that when we started working together with teachers and the National Reading Panel had just come out, we said, we really want teachers to understand the five big ideas. So we said, okay, phonemic awareness is here, phonics is here, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. Um, we said, but wait a second, we've got to get oral language in here. National Reading Panel didn't talk about oral language per se, but we know it's really important 
we believe it's foundational to reading and writing. So we put it in the middle of our wheel. We added spelling over here to phonics, and I'm sure most of you know why we did that. There were reciprocal skills. Likewise, we added writing to our text comprehension segment because they too are reciprocal skills. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also added um, morphology a little while later, but what you're gonna notice here is that we took fluency out of the reading wheel, the original reading wheel, and we, we replaced it with syntax. And why did we do that? Well, I hope by the end of this evening, you will be able to answer that question. Why did we take fluency out and replace it with syntax? Um, stay tuned. Um, this is a slide from Jan. So one of the things that Jan spent time talking about, and if you haven't seen the webinar, it's, it's excellent, is what is an appropriate rate for students to read? And what we have here is um, Jan's number one point about rate is that there's limited evidence that suggests a benefit to reading above the 50th or 75th percentile range. In fact, if you ask kids to read faster and faster just for the sake of reading fast, it can be detrimental. So one of the reasons we took fluency out of the reading wheel is because we saw teachers misinterpreting fluency and misrepresenting it and mis, uh, you know, just nobody's fault. It was just what they thought they should do. They were measuring kids' oral reading fluency scores um, and measuring their words correct per minute. If the child wasn't doing well and wasn't achieving at a certain percentage, they wanted to bump them up to a higher percentage. So we really believe that students would benefit from incorporating fluency into meaningful, explicit syntax instruction. Now, I do want to talk for just a few minutes about students with reading difficulties in the sense that um, all students that have reading difficulties have, by and large, issues with language. They might have issues with phonological processing, so the phonology of language. They might have trouble with the orthography of language. They might have trouble with the syntax, with the pragmatics, all the things that were listed in that table. They could have trouble with one, two, three, or all of them. But that's because the foundation of reading is oral language. And so we have to figure out which students need which elements more or less. Um, you're going to see in a minute profiles for different uh, or three different learning pro profiles. Actually, they're really four. And each one would require a different instructional focus. And the end of the day, what we, what we know is students who struggle with reading don't like to read, they don't find it enjoyable, and therefore other things start to suffer, including vocabulary and reading comprehension. So we met, it probably means that all components of reading instruction may need to be addressed. This comes from Louise Spear Swirling's RTI reading profiles. This picture and slide and the next one um, are based on that whole idea of four profiles um, based on a simple view of reading. So if you think about the simple view of reading, we have language comprehension, and it could be good and good, or it can be weak and weak. And then we have decoding or word recognition. It could be weak, weak, or it could be good, right? In diff four different profiles, we have children who are great with language comprehension and decoding. Those kids are good to go. It's the other three profiles that we have to think about. What are we gonna do for those students? And so if you look at this slide that talks about instructional practices that are aligned with the science of reading, for word recognition, we're going to really think about phonemic awareness and letter instruction, um, decoding, encoding, and then make sure that our students are reading connected text. And these are some examples of things that are not supported by scientific evidence. This comes from the Science of Reading Defining Guide, and I'm sure because the Reading League of Georgia is uh, co-sponsoring this event um, and putting it on, uh, you probably have 
had access or they will give you access to um, the PDF of the Science of Reading Defining Guide. On the flip side of the equation, we have language comprehension. And again, here are some examples of instructional practices aligned with findings from science about reading, read alouds, about robust conversations. And look at this final bullet, explicit instruction in grammatical structures and academic vocabulary is really important for students with language comprehension. Having said that, I would go back to the prior slide and say, we also want to, for the students that have trouble with word recognition skills, make sure we're giving them practice with connected text to build reading fluency and reading fluency, as you'll see this evening, is actually going to um, involve teaching kids how to read in grammatical phrases for meaning. And most of you are, have seen the IDA definition of dyslexia. And again, I just want to point out that secondary consequences, although dyslexia is rooted in phonological difficulties, by and large, secondary consequences include problems with comprehension, vocabulary, et cetera. So officially launching into my conversation, I had to build your background knowledge a little bit about uh, language comprehension and uh, the simple view, et cetera. But now I wanna focus on syntax. So there are four big ideas I wanna to cover tonight that underpin syntax instruction. And I'll take each one in turn. The first one is that oral language provides the foundation. And I've talked a little bit about this, but I wanna elaborate on that. The second is that we have these finite, this finite set of grammatical elements, otherwise known as parts of speech that are the building blocks of syntax. So that's where we're gonna put a lot of focus, especially in the early grades. Um, the third point is that syntax intersects with lots of other things. It's not siloed, it's not, as, not all by itself. It inter, intersects with word meaning and semantics. It intersects with obviously with sentence structure and reading fluency, and of course, comprehension. And the last point that again, I won't get to spend a lot of time with um, talking about tonight is this idea of sentence construction. So can, sentence construction, that is writing a variety of sentence structures is going to reinforce the student's ability to comprehend sentences. Remember, text comprehension and written expression are in the same section of the wheel for good reason. They really do work together. They're reciprocal skills. They bootstrap each other. When kids are reading a paragraph, they should write a quick you know, summary um, of a paragraph or maybe um, a passage. Okay. Um, likewise, when they write something, they should, of course, go back and read it. So they're really very closely tied together. Now, the first point I made was that oral language is the foundation. And what is really important to state is that children come to written language with syntactic knowledge in their oral language, right? They start to put sentences together, albeit short, um, probably around two and a half, three years old, right? They start to learn those individual words and then they put words, um, Riley milk, dog um, bark. You know, they'll, they'll put, they start to put the words together for a sentence and their sentences get longer and longer and longer. Again, it's not mirroring written language per se, but it's certainly there is a there is a connection and we build on that. The oral language tasks that we do in pre-K and kindergarten and all the way through really the grades help develop students' ability to produce and understand a variety of sentences. So in classrooms, teachers, there is a, spend lots of time doing what I call oral rehearsal, asking questions and eliciting a response, but never taking one or two words um, as their answer, right? If you ask them a why question, then they're not gonna just tell you the why, they're going to tell you the, the sentence starter. What's your favorite food? 
my favorite food is pizza because I only get to eat it once a month on special occasions. Or my favorite food is pizza because we get to go out to get it um, and eat at a restaurant. So the because makes that sentence not only longer, but you know, builds in the conjunctions and the relationships between the clauses in that particular sentence. So oral language is very, very important and getting kids to repeat those sentences and the variety of sentences will certainly support their understanding of syntax. Um, and this ability not only supports reading comprehension, as I said, written expression too, right? Because if you have them produce a sentence orally, the easiest thing you can do is say, okay, let's write it down. And if they can't write the whole sentence down, you can give them the sentence starter, my favorite food is, and then they um, they finish it out with pizza, and then they have to add the, the um, second clause to the sentence. The point is that students benefit from explicit syntax instruction that builds their syntactic awareness, which is a metalinguistic skill. I do want to speak, because I'm talking about language here all the time, I do want to talk just briefly about English language learners. A couple of people ask questions about this. I don't have the time tonight to talk extensively about this, but it's certainly an important point and topic um, because English learners often demonstrate difficulties with grammatical structures because their syntax is most likely different than, than English. Um, often incorrect word usage, tense shift, um, pronoun reference are often challenging for our English learners, certainly our Spanish speakers. So what I would say to you is take note of the difficulties so that your instruction can support their where they are in their understanding of the English sentence structure, its syntax. Um, and but here's a little caveat, and this comes from Claude Goldenberg's work, um, who's, you know, he's written a lot of good articles for the American Educator. ELs, L's developing use of English may obscure their content knowledge, so it's important that their language proficiency and content knowledge are assessed separately, right? That may, means that they could have great background knowledge, but because they're not able to um, produce and express the language as clearly, they might, we might not know how much they know and, and conceptually what their understanding is. And I pulled this out last night when I got one of the questions on um, English learners because I love Carol Westby's work and I happened to save this a number of years ago, 2013, when I saw it. But using sentence frames is a very effective way to work with L's um, in terms of building their language and their ability to start with a simple sentence and build it to a comparative sentence where we're using um, we have more blanks, so they're having to fill those in, but we're using more complex structures and conjunctions so that eventually we get them to this complex comparative sentence that you see over here. So let's think about syntactic knowledge, okay? I'm going to um, ask you to, as I show you um, a list of words here. I'm going to ask you to just, obviously I can't hear you. I wish I could and see you, um, but I'm going to ask you to take a look at the words that you see and just think about, um, well, see what we do here. Does anybody know what this is? What part of speech is it? Wow, it's an interjection. Okay, now I'm going to give you the next part of this or the First part of the sentence. We call this a noun phrase, right? It's a noun with its descriptors. Now we have the next part of the sentence. Okay, and this is your verb phrase. And then we have the word so, which is a conjunction. Now I have an independent clause, right? A whole clause right here with my iPhone, okay? I took numerous photos how with my iPhone. So I basically took, this is 
considered a sentence, but this is really the sentence I'm looking at. And I kind of parsed it out in grammatical phrases to help highlight the meaning of this long sentence. And I'm gonna talk more about that. Now, the question is, is this a subject verb object clause right here, or is an object verb subject clause? So some of you know the answer, it's a subject verb object, it goes in that order. And the second clause is also subject verb object. And I'm bringing this up because object verb subject is harder to comp comprehend um, than a, a traditional, what's called canonical order. Subject comes first, then verb, then object. And we'll talk more about that. Syntactic awareness is um, a metalinguistic skill, as I said, that students need to develop to be able to understand sentences. And so as students become conscious of how words are arranged in sentences, they realize that word order impacts the meaning of the sentence, and they start to build this understanding of how words get arranged in sentences. It's just like phonemic awareness, where it's a metalinguistic skill that benefits from explicit instruction or that will increase with explicit instruction. You see the word only in this um, example, Maria ate only one cookie or only Maria ate one cookie. We move that word around, same number of words in the sentence, but the meaning is very different. Only also happens to be a tricky word because only can be an adjective or it can be an adverb. In this case, it's, um, it's an adverb in both, in both cases. Well, what about assessing our students' syntax knowledge? We don't have great assessments for syntax, not informal ones anyway. We have certainly speech and language pathologists have their um, wonderful battery of language assessments and they, are, they can assess the student's syntax knowledge. But in the absence of that, teachers are encouraged to observe their students and listen to them and hear what they're doing in terms of their oral production, what they're using, how nouns, pronouns, and all of these um, words are used in their oral language, and then also analyzing their written language. Um, do they have syntactic awareness? Do they know sentences consists of the subject, the predicate, um, these clauses that I alluded to earlier and phrases? Um, do they understand that there are a variety of sentence structures including a simple sentence with um, you know, one clause, a compound sentence with two independent clauses, and a complex sentence with two or more clauses, one of which is in a dependent clause. So all of this is contributing, will contribute to their understanding um, of syntax and their ability to write uh, sentences and write a variety of sentences. And then the last thing we want to pay attention to is correct use of verb test and tense and subject verb agreement. So what is the role of syntax in reading? A proficient comprehension of text is definitely influenced by adequate syntactic knowledge. Um, why is it important to teach syntax? Well, I hope I've covered some of that, but we know that syntax or text comp composition um, receives little attention, um, something that teachers tell me all the time. I don't feel like I learned syntax very well in school. Um, it was rote memorization. I don't really know how to teach it. So therefore it doesn't get taught, at least not explicitly. So that's really why we want to encourage our teachers to learn about it so that they can feel comfortable teaching their students. Um, and by the way, this, uh, this quote comes from the IDA brief, one of their briefs on um, uh, actually from the structured literacy brief I mentioned earlier. So explicit instruction for sentence comprehension builds grammatical awareness. And we're gonna talk tonight about parsing sentences into phrases. Um, we're gonna talk more about this phrase level and sentence level instruction that we think really boosts students' ability to understand, to comprehend, which is obviously the ultimate goal of reading and understanding what a group of words 
you know, what a phrase is and how a phrase is different from um, a, a um, clause. Now take a second to read this sentence. And so this is what I would call a complex sentence. It doesn't have a complex sentence structure. In fact, this is what we would consider a simple sentence, but it's far from simple. Simple meaning it basically has one independent clause, right? Um, but what makes this, if I had more time with you, I, what makes it complicated? You would tell me, you know, it has, um, it's separated out with commas. It has a hyphen that sets things apart. It has different people's names in it. Um, it's not conventional, certainly um, not conventional sentence structure. But what I would want to start with to say to a, to a child who might be listening to A Place to Land, which is a beautiful, beautiful story about Martin Luther King is, can you find the, the who that this sentence is about? And we know it's Martin. And what's Martin doing in the sentence? And you know, what's the predicate? In other words, what's the verb? Martin saw. Who did Martin see? And then you basically build understanding about the sentence through deconstructing it. Is is essentially what you're doing. So let's talk about why are sentences complex, right? And again, not in the sense of independent dependent clause, but rather what makes sentences hard for kids to understand. There's four different types of sentence uh, complexity that Cheryl Scott talks about. One is long distance gap dependencies where you have um, the pelican is really the subject. And what did the pelican do? Um, stood, um, sorry, looked at the stork, stood on one leg, sorry. Um, the pelican did stand on one leg and it looked at the stork. A stork, sorry. <laughs> anyway, there's a distance between the subject and the predicate and kids will get confused because they'll think the word right before it is the, is the subject of the sentence. Um, a non-canonical order that I mentioned before where you have the object, the dog, the verb was hit and um, what was it hit by? The speeding car, right? Um, sorry, the speeding car is the subject, yes and it hit the dog, but many times we reverse that order using passive tense. So the dog was hit by the speeding car is not canonical, object, verb, subject. We have long noun and verb phrases. This is an example of a very long noun phrase, the words that are written in purple. Um, and then the last thing are the number of propositions that oftentimes we have in a sentence, which aligns with the number of clauses. I'm sure you've seen if you were an English major and you read English literature, they're famous for having 30, 40, five, sometimes 50 word sentences with tons of clauses and you lose track of what's happening in that sentence. Now, another phrase and term that we talk about in addition to syntactic awareness is syntactic knowledge, understanding grammatical structures that support comprehension of text. And here's a quote, which I'm not gonna go through right now because I don't wanna run out of time, but um, this is a great article that Marianne Wolf wrote with um, Stephanie Gottwald about syntactic knowledge and how highly correlated syntactic knowledge is or connected to comprehension. So the third point I want to talk about tonight is that syntax intersects with all these things, semantics, sentence structure, reading fluency. And as such, I believe that it deserves our attention and it can be a lot of fun to, to teach kids about this. And hopefully you'll feel the same way when you see some a couple of videos and hear about some of the ways that we support our kids' um, understanding of syntax. Um, syntax, we believe, is the bridge between fluency and text comprehension. And in this case, we're talking about phrasing and prosody specifically. So let me take a minute um, to talk more about that. And the whole idea that when we're looking at sentences um, and children have to, or the reader has to figure out 
what those words mean in relation to one another. Um, that is how authors convey um, the, the, what's happening in a sentence is the way the words are arranged are arranged a, a certain way to show the connections. Sometimes it's between phrases and other words. Sometimes it's from one clause to another clause. And they use lots of um, different devices to show those relationships, which we'll talk more about. From eight to affinity is really referring to these eight grammatical building blocks that I mentioned earlier. And the building blocks are really what we teach teach kids about. We don't call them parts of speech. We say sentences are made up of building blocks, meaning they're distinct words that have a different function and form a, and and serve a different purpose in the sentence. And together, we put them together in a variety of sentences. You could say an infinite number of syntactic structures are, you know, you know, are possible with these just these eight words, kind of like 26 letters making all these words up, right? So understanding basic sentence structure is key to understanding grammar and how it works. So the first thing we would do, and you can do this with little kids, even preschool children, but let's start with kindergarten. In kindergarten, we can start with this idea of what is a sentence. And what we tell them is a sentence has a who, okay, and a do. The who is what we call the namer. For a young child, for a kindergarten child, it is not a person, place, or thing, because that's very abstract for them. Instead, we say it is a namer because it names a person, place, or thing. And when children read, again, the goal is for them to understand how those words function. Who, who sat or what sat um, or the dog did what? And those questions um, help the student answer comprehension questions or facilitate their comprehension. Most children, if you ask them what is a sentence, if I asked you that, I'm sure a lot of you would say, most of your students will tell you it starts with a capital letter and it ends with a period. And that's what they learn a sentence is. Some of them might say it's a complete thought. A complete thought is a pretty abstract idea, right? For a five-year-old or a six-year-old. So instead we want our little ones to know it has to have a who and a do. And you're gonna see, um, you're gonna see how this works in the video that I'm gonna show you now. So if this isn't playing and you're not hearing it well, can one of my um, colleagues who's helping me, whether it's Kim or Jen or Mary, just let me know that it's you can't hear it or see it. You know the gesture. This one? Do everybody make this gesture? Look, they're all right here too, with the letters that it goes with. So today, now that you're warmed up, you know what our vowels say, right? You're not going to have a difficult time reading these words. So I'm going to have you read some words. You have to decide if the word that you're reading tells me who, so that means it could be a person, a place, or a thing, or an animal. Or does it tell me an action? Is my word an action word that I'm reading? All right, so let's read this first word together. Oh, let's find, I see our, that was fast. Is run, is that a who, or is that something we do? Do. It's something we do. Can you put it under the do column, please? Okay, is it a who or is it something we do? Do. Can you hop? Make your fingers hop. You can, if you can make it happen, it's something that you do. There. All right, so now we have who's and we have do's. And in order to make a sentence, you have to have a who and a do. 
you get to choose who you want to talk about and what they're going to do. And we're going to start off our sentence where we're going to say with a capital letter. With a capital letter. So now say this. The, the frog swims. Good. You want to use it? Pull that over. All right. And look what you said swims. And that's so great. Guess what I have? I have your S there because we don't say the frog swim. We say the frog swims. And then what do I have to, what do you think is on my last card? <laughs> All right, can you say your sentence now? Go ahead and the say it. The frog swims. Have your students say it. You're the teacher. Say, okay, everybody say the sentence. Okay, everybody say the sentence. The frog swims. Now, can you add to it for me? Can you tell me where he swims? Who could tell me where he swims? In the pond. In the pond? Yeah. Okay, let me put these out. In the pond. Good. Let's read that sentence now. Ready? Go. The frog swims in the pond. I'm going to change it to this. Now what does the sentence say? Read the sentence to me. The frog swims. And let's go back to in the pond. Let's change it to not just in the pond. Let's change it to in the big. Do you want it to be big or little? Big. big. The big pond. Okay. Ready? Go ahead. The frog swims in the big pond. Now, let's say. All right. So you could see how Elky really brought in the who and the do. And we do this initially with pictures. So we have kids sorting pictures of who's the nouns or the namers and call into a column of the do's, the action words. And then they can pick a word from each column and put a sentence together. And then you could see she elaborated that sentence and they weren't expected to read, but she was developing some, you know, understanding of where did the frog swim, right, in the pond, and also the phrasing of that, um, that prepositional phrase. So there's a lot you can do. You can watch that video on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, so you can see how that works. Um, you know, I just, in the interest of time, want to want to keep going. This, um, I'm going to send show you another quick video again. I won't show the entire thing, but this is really about building sentences and asking questions of students to help them with this whole idea of sentence structure and um, really being able to phrase in those grammatical entities to also build reading fluency and comprehension. So you'll see what that looks like in this, in this uh, video. scrambled sentence, we have to find the action word, the word that is called the verb. What word here is the doing word? Like you were talking about the who do, it's the do. Ride. Ride, yeah. You can ride, right? Sit down in a car and you ride or you ride a bike. So that's going to be our doing word. Okay. Oh, what did you want to say about this? That's a doing word, but you know what? Since it's a capital, this is that. This is an actually a person's name, okay? Because you could have the name Skip. All right. So here's our do ride. Who? Now, so let's go with a who do. Who is going to ride? Yeah. You're right, and you're right. Stan and Skip. Correct. Put that in front, please. All right, so now what does it say? Stand in the skit ride. Good. All right, what do we have left? The, the, hill, no, the hill. 
Mm, we have stand and skip, ride now, down. Oh, there you go. Does that tell us when or where or why? Down the hill. Does that tell us where they're going? Where are they going? It does tell us where. Does it tell us when they did it? No, it tells us where. So, so this exercise or activity is really easy to do and fun. The kids enjoy it. It's called anagram or sentence building. They have to look for the verb or the action word as Elkie just demonstrated. And then they build the sentence out from there, but they start with a subject and a predicate or a who and a do. Um, kids love doing that activity. So what we want to teach our students here through this process and through these activities is how to understand the basic sentence structure first, which is the who did what to whom or what subject verb object. So you have city dog is the who taught is the do country frog is to whom, right? Who did city dog teach? Now, Again, we explicitly teach that every sentence has a who and a do. Eventually, we're going to teach that the who is the subject, right? Every sentence has a subject. It's the who or what is doing the action. If we want to identify the subject, we would say who or what. In this first sentence, who tossed? Sam tossed. So that answer to that question is your subject. The predicate, every sentence has to have a predicate. That's the do. It's what the subject is doing. It's always a verb. And you can show, again, you can ask the question to find the predicate. What is the namer doing? And that will get you to that, what the predicate of the sentence is. Not all sentences have objects of the verb or um, object from the predicate, but some do. And so that's something we also explicitly teach. We also explicitly teach the function of each of these words. So I'm very quickly going to go through how we do that and then kind of how that leads into understanding more about the sentence structure and how we can expand our students' understanding of sentences as well as their writing. So as I mentioned, nouns name people, places, things and ideas. So it's really important for young children to understand it's a neighbor. We eventually tell them it is also called a noun. But if we're teaching the function, that's what we want to start with. And we would ask the question, who or what did it? Again, you can start this at the listening level, at an oral level, read a simple sentence and say, who or what did the action in this sentence, right? Um, and we have examples of the dog, and the farmhouse. The next part of speech um, or a grammatical building block that we want to teach are verbs. Most tell what the namers do. So their, their function is to tell an action. But as we know, um, they don't all do that. So here's uh, what did the namer do? That's the question, right? Um, so the city dog jumped. Um, but some verbs link, right? And so that's something we'll eventually have to teach. There are a ton of linking verb sentences and kids need to know how those work too. And in this case, the question you would ask is what, right? So city dog is what? City dog is the frog's new friend and is is linking dog with friend. Okay, so... Um, one thing that ha comes up a lot with sentences and teaching syntax is that there's a lot of ambiguity in sentences um, that authors write um, for a variety of reasons, and even that children write. So one of the things that we have to teach children when they're comprehending these sentences is how to clarify ambiguity. And one of the big things um, that we can do and work on with kids is how the word order matters. And I showed that to you earlier with only Maria and only one cookie. Here's another example where we have the same five or six words rather. Um, the only difference is that in this sentence, the men painted the red house. And in this sentence, they painted the house red. Totally different sentence 
meaning, right? Just by moving that, that red word around. Another example, we have blue and sky. When we put sky after blue, sky before blue, um, two very different um, meanings, even at the phrase level here. So the function changed from a noun naming the space around the earth to an adjective describing the color blue. So we can even change how the word is used as a part as a part of speech or as that grammatical element by moving it around. So doing these exercises by putting words on index cards and having the kids on a table or on a pocket chart, move the words around and see what happens. And also talk about violating word order that doesn't work in, in certain cases. And that's something for students to learn more about. We also wanna talk and, and help kids understand the difference between a complete sentence that has a subject and a predicate and fragments because um, Children, for one thing, write fragments often, right? And so we can correct them by saying, oh, what's missing? What's your subject here? What's your predicate? And, and if they're missing one, having them add. But it's interesting too, a case like this is apple trouble. Lots of authors um, write sentences. This looks like a complete sentence. It's got a capital letter, it ends with a punctuation here, but it doesn't have a subject and predicate, right? So we, we want kids to be able to recognize what is a complete sentence and what is a fragment. Um, so we want to go beyond the subject and the predicate or the name or in the action. And the first place to do that is to talk about expanding or telling more about the verb. And the words that tell more about the verb they're called adverbs. And they answer these four questions, where, when, how, and why. And we can use meaning-based questions with text to understand phrases in this example of um, from City Dog Country Frog. And you can see that we have um, this nice sentence and we could say, all right, when, what are the, what's the subject or what's the, what are the namers of the who's it's city dog and country frog and what did they do? They sat, when did they sit in the fall? Where did they sit on the rock? How did they sit? They sat together, right? So asking these, what we call meaning-based questions with the text will help the students understand, but they'll also help them construct sentences in their writing. As I said, the adverbs tell more about the action and they could be single words or they could be adverbial phrases in the country, in the spring, as fast as he could because he was tired, right? So this is also challenging for some students because they're thinking, okay, an adverb is one word, an adjective is one word. And we know that they can often be phrases as I've demonstrated here. We talked a little bit about verb tense and I'm gonna um, just refer you to some of these slides as I'm looking at my time, you'll get these, but this is, um, you saw how Elke dealt with verb tense. Um, I think that was a very effective way to do that. Let's talk about adjectives for a minute. Those um, adjectives expand the namers, right? Or describe the namers. They answer these three questions. So they tell more about the namers. Um, they can be one word, the, or quite a few is an adjectival phrase, right? Um, new games, what kind of games? New games, a wide open field, right? With big eyes, which, which dog or rich frog rather, with the one with big eyes. So it could be an adjective, one word or an adjectival phrase. So we want the students to start with a kernel sentence, a subject and a predicate, but then we want them to expand. And again, we can do this very simply by asking how many dogs heard, what kind, which one. So it was the shaggy dog, it was A, so that tells us how many, A, one. Shaggy, what kind, which one, the one with the brown and white coat. Where did that dog herd? 
He heard it inside the fence. How did he do that with a back and forth motion? And when did he do it? Every afternoon. We can really get our kids to orally produce and then eventually write those um, lengthy sentences and that are really filled with good descriptive language. So I wanna segue now into talking about uh, fluency through phrasing and what we call prosody. And I want to share this slide that Jan shared with us in her webinar, where she talked about suitable expression and that expression is primarily an outcome of comprehension because when kids are reading fluently, they're actually starting to express themselves because they're making meaning as they're reading the sentence. Um, and this, this idea that prosodic competence is best seen as making a contribution to reading and reading comprehension. What does that mean? Let me talk about prosody, text reading prosody. When a child starts to use prosody by using correct word boundaries, use of pauses, they're looking at punctuation marks, intonation patterns, that reflects their understanding of the semantic structure, how those words are used in the sentence and the content. And once text reading prosody performance becomes more advanced, in other words, when kids really read with expression like they're on stage, it will absolutely in turn facilitate reading comprehension. And these, these prosodic elements signal the reader's ability to apply what they know about syntax. So doing reader's theater and having kids perform, is a great way to help build their understanding of prosody that will really catapult their comprehension. We don't talk about prosody a lot in terms of oral reading fluency because we really don't measure it per se, but the NAEP does have an oral reading fluency scale that I'll just call your attention to. And again, in the interest of time, because it's almost 815, I'm just pointing out that there are these four levels and you can refer back to these um, later. Again, another slide from uh, contribution of Jan about the kinds of fluency instruction that will support comprehension. And it really is, as she said, many different kinds of instruction with carefully orchestrated reading practice. So this is where, again, I think syntax can come into play, helping build oral through oral rehearsal and expressive language um, skills and skill development. Uh, this is an article that appeared in Perspectives a few years ago. It's an excellent article about a program that Marianne Wolf and Stephanie Gottwald worked on called RAVO, called Serious Word Play. And um, I've just got it here as a placeholder. If you have a chance, um, I think you can access it through um, International Dyslexia Association. It's really an excellent article. And now I just want to talk about for a few minutes what syntactic parsing or scooping does to help with this idea of uh, prosody and building kids idea about the parts of sentences that have meaning that have meaning. So you can parse the subject, you can parse the predicate, you can parse prepositional phrases, or you can parse into clauses. And I'll give you an example here. You've got You've scooped, city dog didn't stop, right? You've got the subject and the predicate on that first day. When didn't they stop? A prepositional phrase. In the country, another prepositional phrase. He ran, right? Pronoun, verb, as far and as fast as he could and all without a leash. So you can see how this phrasing really supports not only their reading fluency comprehension, but their understanding of how sentences are constructed. Now I'm gonna re really run out of time. So I'm gonna race through this a little bit, but I don't wanna leave out three very important grammatical elements that are called, considered to be meaning links. Why? Because they connect or link words, phrases, and clauses that help the reader make meaning. Those three classes or elements are prepositions, pronouns, and conjunctions. 
um, often referred to as mortar words or the lexical glue that are used in sentences to show relationships, connect ideas, and make references. Also, um, some of these are referred to as cohesive ties. Some of them are, as I said here, conjunctions. So prepositions signal a relationship between words, and this is something we teach our, our kids. Prepositions, you know, in, in terms of relationship um, in, in space, we can actually demonstrate by standing on a chair or ne standing next to the chair or sitting under, scrunching under the chair. Space words, uh, time words are, are a little harder. So this just shows what kind of frog, um, which frog. And they can also answer um, adverbial questions like where did the dog run and when did city dog teach frog etc so these where when how questions that begin with prepositions across during and in pronouns we know replace or refer to nouns pronouns can be challenging for our english learners uh, because they lose track of what those pronouns are referring back to in terms of um, the name, the namers that they refer to. So here are some examples of pronouns. And then we have our conjunctions that come in two varieties, coordinating conjunctions and our subordinating conjunctions. And those join equal parts or unequal parts. And last but not least, we have our interjection, hmm, or wow, or gee whiz, that express emotion. Um, I am going to stop in two minutes, I promise. I'm very close. Um, last thing I want to say about this um, idea of, of syntax is that we also have to address punctuation. Punctuation can get in the way of comprehension. Many of you have experienced students who read right through the punctuation marks. So we really have to spend time explicitly teaching how uh, punctuation works. Uh, this is just an example of trees with the apostrophe for possession and without showing plural. Um, and I'm gonna skip that and I'm gonna end on this note talking about sentence construction. Um, and that is something I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, that this idea of constructing sentences at the oral level that then gets transferred to writing is really something that I think um, hopefully you'll hear more about. I'm sure you will in the webinar in April. But asking these questions to help the students unpack the meaning of the text, as well as asking the questions to expand sentences that develops expressive language. Um, and the process, as I say, begins with these metacognitive questions that build upon the base sentence that we talked about quite a bit um, here. This is just some funny sentences and you're gonna get these slides. So I'm gonna let you read those um, at another point in time. I have a quick summary here, which I'm gonna let you read at your leisure when you get these slides. Some references that I mentioned this evening, along with some resources. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. Here's my email address and I welcome, um, Welcome and would love to hear from you. So sorry I went over time a few minutes. Um, always way more to cover than I than I could possibly do justice to. Margie, thank you so much. And actually, uh, many of the questions that we received ahead of time, I know you saw those. Um, you've addressed uh, many of those. Um, I do have a couple questions um, that have come in uh, while you were speaking. Um, and by the way, that's a lot of information for all of us to hold on to and to um, to think about. Um, one of the questions, uh, and you've talked uh, some about what um, teaching syntax with younger children looks like. We saw some of the things with uh, the children with the uh, namers and uh, that sort of thing. But what, what do you recommend for teaching upper elementary uh, students um, with little to no previous instruction in syntax and grammar? And I'm gonna th throw one more uh, question in there. Um, someone asked uh, this evening, how important is it to use grammatical terminology during explicit instructions? There's, there's got to be a place where you move from, you know, naming yes. 
Right, right. Okay, so the let's start there. Um, I like I said, I really want young students to understand the function of the words and sentences because we can all remember how we learned grammar and most of us basically circled nouns underlined verbs and we learned we didn't learn it as a function you know functional piece like all these words have certain very specific role to play in a sentence right um, and that definitely impacts your ability to understand sentences and then of course to write sentences so I think eventually you transition them to noun, verb, like a lot of times on pocket charts, I'll say namer, action, and then I'll eventually put the word noun at the top of the column for namer, and I'll put verb at the top of the column for adjective, I'm sorry, for verb. Um, and likewise, I'll start to use um, subject and predicate because I definitely want them to understand the difference between the subject and a predicate, right? A subject, um, is a namer, right? But it also has more information within it, right? It can have ex it can have adjectives, etc. Likewise, predicates, right? A uh, complete predicate has that expanded information, those adverbs, etc. So I do want to use the terminology, um, and it transitions students. And this will get me into talking for a couple minutes about middle school students that we do want our middle school students to understand syntax. It's really, really important, again, specifically for them for writing. And writing is such, I think, is such a hard thing to teach, um, to do well. Our teachers complain all the time that they don't feel well equipped to teach kids to write. But I think if we if we taught the elements of, of grammar, the way I just described it, and then brought in the writing process um, and wove that into the explicit instruction of the grammar and how it works in sentences, we would, we would serve them well. Um, and it certainly would help with comprehension too. I think the challenge is most teachers in middle and high school don't see themselves as grammar teachers. So I would say in high school, seek out your English teachers because they know a lot about syntax and grammar. They would be able to share resources with you. I'm quite certain. Um, I've met wonderful high school teachers that have um, really taught me a lot. And, um, and then I think you have to just really be diagnostic too, in terms of which kids are going to need to go back to the beginning. And Quite honestly, because writing has been taught as a process and not necessarily explicitly at the sentence level, I think we can't assume that students really even understand sentences at a very basic level. So just teaching that concept is, is definitely going to go a long way. Okay, um, because you were talking about um, utilizing um, like ELA teachers in middle and high school, um, I have a, a couple of people ask questions about how uh, speech and language pathologists um, can help support uh, teachers and also students. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I love this question. We got a couple questions um, about speech and language pathologists. They have such an important role to serve because they're, they have so much knowledge about language. So I think getting speech and language pathologists out of their clinical setting, if possible, when possible, and pushing into classrooms and getting them to, you know, even participate in working with small groups of students, helping them with the oral Ex, you know, rehearsal exercises that I just explained, even working with teachers and explaining why a sentence repetition task, because they assess all these syntactic, um, syntactic awareness. Why is that a powerful, um, you know, assessment tool to know what a student understands about syntax? So I think they, they serve really important roles and many of them like being asked and like, helping with it. You know, the, the challenge is always getting the time. Absolutely. So, uh, and I appreciate that, that uh, working together uh, is very helpful, uh, both for teachers and then also for speech and language pathologists to, to see students in those environments uh, mm -hmm. in language. Um, we've had a couple of questions about resources, and I know you, um, at the very end of your slide presentation, you listed some resources, um, but two, two kinds of resources. One is things to use in the classroom, and then also resources um, 
to help teachers learn more um, about syntax. And I know uh, we had one question, um, I think Jen has uh, put it in the chat about uh, Carol Westby's um, article on sentence frames, but are there other researchers or um, people or just folks that you would send teachers to, send us uh, tutors to, educators to, to learn more about syntax? I mean, I would love to know if anyone knows of one um, other than one that I'm going to recommend that I often recommend to teachers that don't have a clear, um, like their grammar instruction was so long ago and it was not necessarily effective and to build their background knowledge because you can't teach what you don't know, obviously. Um, Laura Justice and um, her colleague, I don't know what her first name is, but Ezell, E-Z-E-L-L, it's in the resource list that you'll see in your um in your handout, um, it's a it's basically a handbook to teach syntax, and it has quizzes at the end of each chapter. So it's for teachers, really, and educators to build your knowledge. Um, in terms of resources for teaching syntax and teaching um, writing, because I think the two really do go hand in glove. Um, my one of my favorites is the Writing Revolution, and I believe that. Your speaker, um, and I forget, Dreyer is it? Lord Lord Dreyer, Dreyer yeah. is um, is going to talk about the writing revolution by um, Judy Hockman and Natalie Wexler. Great resource for teaching writing, and it's very explicit in terms of sentence um, building. Another one um, is. Diana Hambrary King is also very well um, respected in teaching writing and explicitly teaching writing. Um, who else did I write down on my cheat sheet? Hang on a second. Um, I think William Van Cleve's work. Oh, William Van Cleve's work. Um, William Van Cleve, someone who is a phenomenal giant in the field who we lost about now almost two years ago, sadly. Um, but he's got a treasure trove of writing materials on his website. Um, and then framing your thoughts has been around for a long time, but I think it's an excellent um, writing, writing, I wouldn't call it a program, I guess it's a program, but it very explicitly teaches sentence structure and sentence writing. Margie, thank you so much. Um, we're going to need to end, unfortunately, but uh, thank you for everything, all the information you've given us, the resources, and we look forward to um, putting, the, your, the, putting this up on our website, the IDA website, as well as a copy of your, your slides. Um, to those of you who joined us tonight, thank you for um, attending and uh, all attendees uh, of tonight's live event will receive an email within 24 hours from IDA Georgia. That email will include a link to a survey slash request for a certificate of attendance form. If you do not see that email in your inbox, uh, please be sure to check your junk and spam folders. If you complete that form anytime before this coming Monday, you will receive your certificate on Monday, February the 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, also, if you have colleagues who missed tonight's webinar, uh, please let them know that all registrants will be receiving a link to the webinar with specific instructions on how to earn a certificate of attendance uh, for viewing the recorded webinar. And lastly, we hope that um, you'll join us for our webinar on March the 2nd at 7 p.m. entitled Supporting Dual Language Learners, Reading Development and Achievement. Uh, the speaker will be uh, Dr. Jeanette Mancilla Martinez from the Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. So thank you again for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you all.